My name is Nadia Abulhaj. I'm the co-director of the center here and also a professor of anthropology at, at Columbia and Barnum. Um, so we feel privileged to host um, this panel today where we're gonna hear from students and others who are on the ground in Palestine and Israel about recent events at Israeli universities. I'm just gonna say a few words uh, to open. <clears throat> Over the past month or more, we've witnessed the ongoing intensification of both state and mob violence against Palestinians under Israeli rule, as well as in the Palestinian resistance to that violence, most especially in East Jerusalem, in Gaza, and of course, inside the Green Line. One of the issues that was most remarked upon in the US press this past May, amidst the battles over ethnic cleansing in Sheikh Jarrah and the assault on Gaza, was the fact that in so-called mixed cities inside the Green Line, the fact that those mixed cities also witness Palestinians protesting in the streets. Of course, here, that is in the context of the US, such acts were largely portrayed in ways that don't capture, or they did not capture either what was going on or what was at stake. These were de depicted as riots on both sides, as if there was some structural equivalence, let alone the fact that one side was backed by the state and involved organized mobs in sharp contrast to the other. Moreover, the American press seemed to be full of interviews in which Israeli Jews, for example, Jewish residents of Lod, expressed astonishment over the fact that their Arab neighbors were attacking them after decades of peaceful coexistence. The long durée of ethnic cleansing of the Jew Judaization of Arab towns and regions in Israel, including in recent years in Lod itself, was largely papered over in such accounts and certainly by the interviewees. The panel today speaks to those often obscured realities and that to the belief, the insistence in fact, fact. Um, that Israel can be and is both a Jewish and a democratic state at the same time. Having said that, our focus today is on the Israeli economy. One of the, one of the first videos sent to me upon Israel beginning its most recent attack on Gaza was of the border police beating Palestinian students at Ben Gurion University who were protesting peacefully outside the university president's office. Those kinds of incidents receive, vir receive virtually no attention in the US in the mainstream press. And our speakers today are going to touch on both the responses at universities to the recent protests amongst 48 Palestinians, as well as the long-term structural issues that Palestinian students and faculty face at Israeli universities structural issues, which of course can be understood only within the larger context of the position of Palestinian citizens in a self-avowedly Jewish state. This event was initiated and organized by Academia for Equality, which is a grassroots movement of I think 700 or so members committed to promoting democratization, equality, and access to higher education for all communities living in Israel. A member-based organization, one of its projects is the database of quote, complicit academy, of the complicit academy, um, which seems especially important uh, today, given what we're discussing to just quote from the description of that project, quote, um, it documents Israeli academic institutions, repression of dissent, institutionalized racism against Palestinian students and faculty, unquote. I wanna thank them, especially the academy for equality, for their labor in preparing this panel. I would also like to thank what is a long list of co-sponsors who are located in the US, in Britain and South Africa, academic institutions of one sort or another. But for the sake of time, I ask you if you want to know the specific list to go to the Center for Palestine Studies um, website where they are all there. Finally, I'm gonna say one third thing about logistics and then just introduce um, the person who will be moderating the panel. After the speakers complete their um, presentations, which are five to 10 minutes each, we will have time for Q&A. Um, so you should post your questions in the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. So let me finally uh, end by introducing one of our um, uh, participants today. Rabia Erbaria is a human rights lawyer with the Adala Legal Center in Haifa and a doctoral student at Harvard Law School. He's the author of numerous publications about Palestinian students in Israeli law schools and about the criminalization of Palestinian herb picking culture, among other topics. I now will hand the floor or the screen over to Rabia, who will um, introduce the, the remaining speakers and or the speakers and also will moderate uh, the discussion until the Q&A. Thank you. 
Thank you, Nadia, for this uh, brilliant opening. Um, I'm happy we are gathering today uh, to visualize the struggles of Palestinian students, those in Israeli academia in particular. I just want to mention before moving on to the panel and introducing them that uh, although this event is centering the often overlooked experience of Palestinian students in Israeli institutions, uh, who are of course Palestinian citizens of Israel, it is crucial to keep also in mind as we talk about oppression of Palestinians and as you will hear uh, from our participants today that this violence also extends and is inherent to the violence that Palestinian students in the West Bank and in Gaza are experiencing. Uh, if you haven't heard about the um, ongoing abductions of students from the Beers 8 campus, um, the military trials that are taking place there as well, you are uh, more than welcome to please read about it. So I'll stop here and we will move to our uh, first panelist, who is Aris Pshara. Aris is a researcher and a PhD candidate in sociology at Tel Aviv University. Aris is also the, uh, the social and academic coordinator of Sa Sa SAWA program for empowering Palestinian students. So please welcome Aris, Aris for um, the first um, intervention in this panel and we will hear from her. Thank you, Rabi and Shukran. Marhaba, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone, wherever you are right now. First of all, I would like to thank Academia for Equality for inviting me and for organizing this important event and also for acknowledging the importance of amplifying our voices as Palestinian scholars and students. And today I'm going to talk about the Palestinian students in Israeli academia during the current uprising due to the past political events. I will begin my talk with a quote from Dr. Hunayda Ghanim's book, Reinventing the Nation, Palestinian Intellectuals. Ghanim examines the liminal experiences among Palestinian intellectuals and focuses on the language and the struggle of identity among Palestinian students in the, higher, in the Israeli higher education institutions. And she said, at university, you enter a place where there is no room for your language. The language is someone else's. It's a foreign language, antagonistic to you and to your nation. At first glance, it looks objective and innocent, but in reality, it's preparing a sweetened trap for you, murderous, but without pain and without blood. And if you adopt the language and the discourse that it creates, you are finding yourself and your own native language. And if you decide to fight against it, you become a fighter like a Don Quixote. And then the owners of the language stare at you angrily and prepare to attack you. So you are caught in a trap until you see a book entitled, The One Who Doesn't Belong, and you say to yourself, oh, that's me. This quote described by Dr. Hunayda Ghanem is part of the logic of elimination of the native led by the Israeli colonial re regime towards the Palestinian people. The Palestinian people live under a separate colonial regime since 1948 that operates four different colonial systems in 48 territories in East Jerusalem, in West Bank, and in Gaza. They suffer from systematic colonial practices, racism and discrimination, police brutality, economic, social and cultural marginalization, and land annexation and home demolitions, a legislation of multiple racist laws such as the Nakba law and nation state law that are threatened our existence as indigenous people in our own homeland. In the academic context, the Israeli governments have rejected building a Palestinian Arab university within the green line over the years forcing Palestinian students to pursue higher education in the Israeli academia, which operates practices of inclusion, exclusion and silencing. Recent events have shown an escalation in the attitude toward the Palestinian students in the Green Line. Palestinian students got arrested and became a target without any protection from the academic institutions. They faced attacks and incitement on the streets, social media, and campuses by the Israeli police forces, Jewish extremist groups, Jewish students, and teachers. Therefore, most of them have fled campuses and are afraid to return. The Israeli higher education system, by the way, has undergone some significant changes lately, manifested among other factors in the growing number of Palestinian students attending institutions of higher education. According to the Israeli Central Bureau of Statistics, within a decade, the number of Palestinian students studying in the higher education system doubled from 22,000 in 2007 to 53,000 in 2020. Approximately 17% of the total number of the students in Israeli higher education system are Palestinian students. 
This proliferation involves the emergence of a new Palestinian social educated group, the third generation since the Nakba, with diverse socioeconomic, religious, and social backgrounds. This new Palestinian group, pl group pl plays an important and effective role in promoting the Palestinian society economically, socially, and politically. For Palestinian students, the Israeli campus is a liminal alternative and racial space built on destroyed Palestinian villages where their individual, collective, and national identities are developed and challenged daily. As Rabia mentioned before, I work as a social and academic coordinator at SAWA program. SAWA means together in Arabic. SAWA is a program caring for the needs of the Palestinian student community in Tel Aviv University. During the previous events, we have formed an emergency unit consisting of 99 Palestinian members in order to assist and support the Palestinian student in Tel Aviv University 24 seven. As a result, the Equality and Diversity Commission led by Professor Neta Aziv has formed a hotline for complaints of offensive acts and incitement to violence and racism. Furthermore, we created a telegram group for Palestinian students, but the Sheen Bay hijacked it and started to threaten us. Jewish teachers and students were also part of the persecution, delegitimization, and incitement campaign against us on Zoom and social media. Reem, a Palestinian student, shared with me her feelings during this, these events. We live under a constant threat. We feel threatened inside our homes and campuses. Personally, I live in Haifa with my parents, and the situation there is bad. We live under constant fear. Last night was a nightmare. My family and I didn't sleep at all because of the Jewish extremist group who burned property in my neighborhood near my home. We tried to call the police and the fire services, but there wasn't no answer. They didn't bother to come because they didn't even care about our lives. All this is legitimized by police and media. We felt insecure and the university has, hasn't made any decision yet. I'm aware of the importance of my academic education. But as a Palestinian student, I'm not even able to go down to buy a bottle of water from the grocery store. My classmates and I live in a dangerous area in the, at the moment, and this current situation doesn't allow us to study. We are trying to survive at this moment. I ran away from Tel Aviv to be with my family and to feel more secure, but even here, the situation is extremely difficult. We are afraid to return to the campus, taking a bus or train or even speak in Arabic at public spaces. What is going through my mind right now, she said, is whether I survive the night alive and who will protect me from these rioters. I seek to study like everyone else, she said. We will never give up, give up on our basic right to pursue an academic education, but at least we should be able to experience academic education under fair and equal conditions in a safe campus. If I have a minute left, I would love to continue for one another testimony from Hani. Palestinian student at university in Be'er Sheva, Be'er Sabah, narrating the story of his arrest by the occupation military forces. In one day, I turned from engineering student to a criminal person. The police investigator told me to say goodbye to my dreams. You wanted to protest, to protest, huh? Then you forget about becoming an engineer. He said on my way to the, in the dorms, I've noticed a demonstration in campus. The police fired a stun grenade at the Palestinian students and began pushing us into the dorms building and I got arrested by undercover cop on campus. About an hour after the demonstration began, right-wing activists gathered around us, attacked us and threatened us with knives and illegal weapons, shouting, chanting, death to Arabs. The police didn't arrest them, they only arrested us, even though we were protesting legally and peacefully. I arrived at my home in the Galili only after eight days, during which I was in detention in the Naqab. At the end, I call for justice and freedom to our students, hand off Palestinian students in and out the green line and stop the administrative detention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ariz, Ariz for this brilliant and powerful um, intervention. I uh, really think that this framing is very, very helpful to situate the experience of Palestinian students uh, in the wider structure of violence and settler colonialism we've all been going through, particularly the events that have been happening in the last few weeks um, in May uh, among Palestinian citizens of Israel who have been uh, subject to, as Nadia mentioned, mob attacks, um, Jewish vigilante groups attacking them, emboldened and protected by the police in Haifa and in Jaffa and in Lad and in elsewhere. 
Um, I think the, the Aris, you, you did a brilliant job in explaining how this logic of the mob extends from the mobs in the street to, to the more institutionalized mobs we often attend as universities. Um, uh, let's move on and uh, welcome Yara Shaheen Gharabd, uh, who will be speaking next. Yara is a social and political activist from Yafa. Yara is also studying history and gender studies at Tel Aviv University. So uh, please uh, let us welcome Yara. Yara, the, the floor is yours. I just want to, I remember to mention that um, I, I stepped in as moderator because Arish Sabah Khuri uh, couldn't make it last minute. Uh, and so she apologizes for that. Let's hear from Yara. Hi, thank you, Rabia. And uh, I want to apologize, first of all, because I want to be able to open the camera. Uh, the net here is not stable. So uh, thank you for having me and thank you for participating all. This is a good uh, and impor important initiative. So thank you for that. Um, I was asked in this panel to talk about the situation, especially in the light of all the recent events in, in, in Yaffa that happened and happening still, because it's not over, I think, and we are still t talking about it and processing it. Uh, in general, in Tel Aviv, but also in Yaffa or Jaffa, uh, but I would like to refer to Jaffa as Yaffa um, and, uh, be, and hold on this uh, term. Um, I will talk mainly about the dilemmas, feelings, and the situation which we, the Palestinian students st studying in Tel Aviv University who are not detached from the reality in Yaffa are faced. Um, it is difficult to me, it is difficult to, to detach this social context, especially because of the geographical location of Tel Aviv that is part of historical Jaffa, Yaffa. It, is seem, it, it seems that in Tel Aviv, uh, the business is as usual, because we too are talking about the Tel Aviv space as a pink bubble, but still with all the so-called liberality that Tel Aviv tries to show as a liberal accepting enlightened space, we have encountered many situations in which we are required to declare our intentions and condemn all sorts of action on our part. We found ourselves, we the Palestinians, found ourselves returning to our homes from the dormitories because there we felt safe and protected. Um, and it is well established fact that few are the places where we feel protected and secured. And this period has proven to us all that the only option in which we can protect ourselves is on our own. The prevailing sense of the alienation with which we enter the university is a feeling that still accompanies us and especially in, in such a situation, tension, attacks on Gaza and attacks in Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan neighborhood in East and West of Jerusalem. We are forced to remain silent about the situation, normalize it or even accept it as such because it becomes political and it is impossible to talk about politics in academia. We are forced to remain silent. Things happen on a daily basis while question about further studies become privileges for us. And here I want to ask, how are we to hold all this together? Unlike any other before, the vast majority of our students participated in the demonstration. Like we were an active part of it on, on streets. We all got politicized in the light of the recent events, which for, forced us to take a stand, whether we like it or not. And here's a saying that personal is political is not a mantra, but an act that we felt on ourselves in the most aggressive and cruel, brutal way. For example, by the police who harassed us in demonstration and actually in every demonstration. This, this was a serious dilemma. We start with the sentences of, we are with you, but I would like to, to share. Share with you an, an anecdote that really of this sort. And I wrote it, I wrote about it today. I was passing 
Neto, the Gilman cafeteria, there everything seemed surrealistic, as if the recent turbulence passed over this place, as if it, it remained untouched. Still, I sat there and could hear all sorts of small talks, think normally. But at some point there, I overheard the discussion about the milita military service and the IDF. They talked about it in with the nostalgic take and sense and occasionally threw out all sorts of sentences like, whoa, bro, if I, 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 I was going to Gaza, what I would do there. And I want to think and ask how much violence is embodied in this discourse that is supposed to be ordinary, trivial, trivial and random. Think it's only 12 afternoon. How am I except expected to hear individual, uh, sorry, how am I expected to hear this and continue with my day in a non-political way, as they asked me, just like that. There is a difference between a violent society and one that normalizes any patterns of violence. Moreover, when the institu institution itself dictates and defines when it is counted as a violence and when it, it is not. And here too, in the academic space, the discourse that's supposed to be intellectual and critical preserves and replicates militarism. And after that, again, we Palestinian students are asked to come out with the defensive st statements when in reality, everything is political. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Yara, uh, for passing this powerful uh, experience of how even a coffee can become such a emotionally tasking uh, task in uh, Israeli campuses. Uh, we'll now move on to Khaled. Khaled Ghanayim is a student at Ben Gurion University in Bir Saba. He's also a member of the student council there, and he will tell us more about the events that took place in uh, Ben Gurion University. Khaled, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rabir. Thank you all for organizing this uh, important uh, event. Uh, I will talk more about a specific event that occurred in the University of uh, Ben Gurion, which is uh, uh, which is in uh, Beer Sheva uh, city uh, in south of Israel, where uh, where I learned there, where I studied there. In the day of the 11th of May. Students made a demonstration uh, for solidarity with the cause of Sheikh Jarrah, which all have heard about it in Jerusalem. Through this the demonstration, uh, some people who are the pop, uh, people of, of the place of Beersheba made a, another demonstration, but they came armed with knives and stones and things like that, and they have attacked the students. Uh, the police, which was there, they have attacked the students too. We had seven students arrested. Uh, they went to courts. Some of them stayed arrested for about seven, eight days. Students who didn't do anything. More than that, the students uh, went to their rooms where they live. But the other protesters has attacked them. Uh, the university, uh, the university security, which which uh, which they should secure the students, they did the opposite. Some of them have arrested the students. They were policemen uh, at this event. Some of them have has attacked them physically. Uh, they didn't do their job. So me and uh, my fellow Iman, which uh, should be with us uh, as uh, members of the student council we send a letter to the president and the rector of the university to claim what happened and to to like to, to speak on behalf of the students which was harmed but you would be amazed of the response that we got we asked we asked the president to, to be more tough in their statements, to punish the people who has break the law, the law of the country and the law of the university. But what happened is that some of, especially right-wing uh, political side, uh, they gave message to the university. It's like a threatening message. 
that we may harm the university in some way, uh, mostly uh, by Tamwil, by fundings, funding, by funding the university if they took uh, a strict uh, attitude. Uh, we made a meeting with the university's president and some of the staff, but we didn't have that, uh, what we expected. The university didn't took their responsibility of what happened. They didn't take responsibility of the behaviors of the uh, security guys. And more than that, some of the lecturers has, uh, have written some Gizanit, on sorry, some racist, racist. some racist uh, statements in Facebook and other social media. Their own students, uh, their own their own students were afraid to learn uh, with these uh, people. One of the students which was arrested said a uh, said a sentence, and he said it in his investigation for the cops. He said, we, we always said that there is an apartheid regime here, but we say that about what happened between Israel and the uh, Palestinian uh, land and the Palestinian government. But we see that here. We see that the policemen and the security of the university, which their job is to, pr to protect us, they have attacked us but we wasn't attackers. The attackers were sent free. We can put that in the context, which was then. We can explain what happened because the protest or the demonstration was in the same time when the situation is escalated with Gaza. It was in the same day. And it was with the same day when it started the riots inside Israel, inside the Green Line. So, we can put all of that and we can explain what happened with the students and the attitude of the policemen. Because after that, in one week, the police has arrested more than 2,000 guys for all what happened in the universities and in the cities and in the villages. All of them were Arabs, all of them. Between all the 2,000 people who were arrested, only 100, maximum 200 people went to jail, which is, which is a very low percentage, which give us an indicator how the government look at the minority here and how this reflect on the universities and how, they, uh, and how they look to their students, the Arab students. Like in my university, in my Ben Gurion University, there is about 2,500 students, which are 15% of the, the total uh, students. Uh, after all the events with, uh, that, that occurred then, the, the academic for equality made an event just a couple of, of hours after. About 500 students of them has participated in, which, which is a sign that we have a big thing here. The university should make something. The regime should make something, but they didn't do anything. After that, in a couple of days, individual students have released a, a petition. 1,000 students of these 2,500 have signed this petition, uh, which, sa which says that we reject what the university did, how they didn't take responsibility, and we are thinking, thinking again to uh, study in this university or live in their dorms. With all of that, the university didn't take a responsible attitude. They didn't have, a, they didn't make any operative steps. Practical steps. Operative steps or acts against the people who has break the law, which are their workers, which are their employees. And until now, we are about a month and a half, more than a half, after these events, the university, they are like living in denial. They didn't do anything until now. And I, I can say 
that this happened in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, in Haifa and Technion Universities in Haifa, and in Tel Aviv. And all of that was against the, the minority, the Palestinian Arab students in this university, and the universities didn't take a responsible attitude. All of that is reflecting the government and the government's attitude. So it's like a hierarchy. It's something, it's like a chain that is continuing. And I thank you for Thank you a lot, Khalid, for sharing all these details with us and reminding us how universities and administrations and security forces in the university can suddenly turn from their supposed duty to protect the students into actually arresting them and joining the Jewish supremacist mobs in doing so. Um, these are events that have been happening over May 2021, over the last month, all over Palestine, as we mentioned before. And as Khaled mentioned, there has been a mass wave of arrests uh, that exceeded around 2,000 arrests overwhelmingly against Palestinian citizens of Israel, with very few actually indictments brought to court relatively. But still, we have to understand that all these legal, legal measures that have been used are kind of unprecedented uh, in their um, involvement of the secret security apparatus, in their involvement of uh, illegal arrests, in their involvement of um, um, uh, provisions that are uh, uh, ban um, legal counseling uh, from the arrested uh, people. So, and I think we still, as Yara also previously mentioned, we still haven't processed all this ongoing lawfare that has been waged against Palestinians uh, in Israel. It is still ongoing um, and we can see it. Um, I want us to move on right now and, uh, and say, just before that, I want to say also that the, a lot of these experiences and a lot of the arrests, there is a gap in the way um, Palestinian voices have been basically silenced in Israel. And we, we still feel that under the surface of ostensible normalcy uh, that has kind of returned into the Jewish mainstream um, lives here in Israel, um, we, we still see that our voices, our experiences have not had uh, being centered, have not had been heard. Uh, and so the, this, this event in this sense is very important to center these experiences as particular experiences of students in a wider frame. Uh, I want to invite Rafat now, who will continue to talk from here. Rafat uh, is a journalist and an activist from Laqiya village in Al Naqab. And Rafat is also a recent graduate of law school. So Rafat, please feel free to start. Hello everyone. So I, I think I'll be uh, I'll be going on some of the stories that uh, my other colleagues talked about. I hope I'm, uh, my sound is clear. Uh, it's, it's a very weird connection in here. Anyway, so I'll be talking about some of the stories my colleagues uh, introduced and talked about with cases that happened to students in the in the past few weeks, and also the whole issue that's come because when we talk about students because of the forum we're in, we shouldn't forget the rest of the society that was suffering more and more and, and same and with the same events and with the same methods of uh, uh, of Israeli uh, of Israeli force against Arabs in, in the 48. So I come from the Naqab, I come from the city that had uh, the case of the students of Beer Sheba. Uh, I was for me, my, my personal testimony about the case is that I was a participant of that protest that was uh, uh, was crushed by the by the Israeli police, and when I witnessed the case, and was I was one of the uh, participants with the students I was photographing at the time that were chased by Israeli right wings and settlers and citizens of Beersheba. More than 200 participants. Uh, Jewish Israeli right wing people were chasing the students and trying to lynch them and beat them. Uh, at the time, but uh, the, the only thing that the student could have done after participate, what happened is that they were participating in a very in a legal protest that was legalized by the Israeli police, and then uh, the Israeli uh, people of Beersheba didn't like get that Palestinians were protesting in the city in front of the, the campus, 
to against the Israeli crimes in, in Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, the, the, the students were chased by settlers, and when they asked for help from the police, the, the students were the ones who called the police in order to get protection from what, uh, what the Israeli right wings were doing. And then the, when the police came, it came very hard on the students and beat it, uh, uh, more than 10 students in the, in the spot and there's eight of them, seven of them that I was one of them and my other brother was there. I was taken by the Shabak for three days. Uh, the Shin Beit took me on another allegation, but on another uh, case, but uh, they found me in that protest and they came to me with the name. After three days of, uh, of interrogations, they found, uh, yani, uh, I was able to prove and then the case was proven that they're just trying to make a case for me because I'm an activist as it's happening to lots of activists uh, and most of the activists in, in Palestine from the Naqab to Haifa. Uh, three days of interrogations with the Shabak, but then I was since day one saying that just open the cameras of my apartment and you will see that I was in different places in the same you were accusing me of that case. Anyway, when I came out, out I found out my younger brother uh, I found out uh, my younger brother was arrested too, and he was a student at the time, and he took 15 days in jail without any re illegal allegation against him at the time, and all the videos were showing that uh, he was the one beaten by, by the police and assaulted by the police officers. More than 10 police officers were, were beating him in front, of, uh, in front of the campus. So what happened and what we saw in the Israeli courts in the past few weeks, in the few weeks after the recent events, is that all the authorities of uh, of the government or the authorities of Israel, uh, when we talk about the justice system and the police and the Knesset, uh, the Congress, were working against Arabs and in order to convict Arabs as, as much as they can uh, as one big force, racist force against people. The judges were giving uh, decisions to keep the lock, the locking of students without no real uh, clues, without no real uh, pictures or any, any clues on them, just to make the society afraid and uh, to not participate anymore with freedom of speech activities against what the, what, what the government was doing, the Israeli government and Israel was doing in, in Gaza and in Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, my brother got 15 days of, former, of, uh, of prison time then and he still have uh, an accusing list uh, and same as four other students from, from the college who suffered so much at the time. None of the Israelis who were ch chasing these uh, And one of the funny cases that we found in court that in the same day that these students that were beat, beaten on video by, by the police uh, and they were uh, giving, they stayed in jail for more than 50 days. Uh, they, they renewed their, their lo lockage, the lockage for the students. Two Israelis were uh, were in court because they were arrested, and they admitted uh, to the police that they were they had sticks and they had uh, knives, and they were looking for Arabs to beat in Beersheba city, but they were released normally. Uh, so racism was very obvious, and I think it is. And I don't believe that there is any other democratic country that considers itself democratic in the world would do such a thing to students when it's well known that's one of the main factors of real democracy going is uh, real student activism and the re a real student freedom of speech that will fit camera and the real freedom of speech uh, uh, way of and of presenting and no uh, no crushing to that so i don't believe that's happening in israel the past few weeks showed us exactly that in one point the israel democracy could stop and all the, the authorities of, of the country would, would act as one as a race, as one racist authority, and that's what happened with us. I would be happy to talk more after more questions over. Thank you so much, Rafat, for sharing all this um, painful experience. It must be um, hard to go again and again through trying to to prove uh, generally that's the, the, the experience we many times face is that we are, um, you know, as you, you mentioned in your interrogation, we are accused of things that we, we, we by accident can or cannot prove our innocence. Many of these protests, I want to say, that happened across Palestine and in universities in particular started uh, with a wave of peaceful protests that um, started from Sheikh Jarrah, from Jerusalem, spread all over Palestine, and were met with both police brutality 
and uh, mob violence um, that led to all these escalations, obviously, uh, with Gaza um, being attacked later on and um, during the same time, and also escalations in the West Bank. So I think the, the, the role of Palestinians, um, citizens of Israel, and particularly Palestinian students in campuses is crucial because it really highlights how um, these recent events have been uh, uniting Palestinians regardless of official statuses, different official statuses or different legal statuses um, between the river and the sea. And, and we know very well that the legal system works to fragment Palestinians and uh, create different subjectivities for Palestinians, dubbing some Palestinian citizens of Israel as Arab Israelis. It's, it's important to acknowledge and be aware that this is official Israeli propaganda terminology that, in fact, most Palestinians do not agree with, according to numerous uh, researchers. Um, as a way of concluding, I, before, before that, I just want to um, flag that in the chat, either now or later on in the event, there will be a document with a link with suggestions about uh, places to contribute or organizations, etc. So that um, make sure you check that out. Um, as a way of concluding, um, we, we're sorry Iman couldn't join us today as well, but as a way of concluding, I, I want to try to sum up and uh, highlight some of the themes that stem from these important accounts we have been hearing today before opening to the, um, moving back to, to Nadia to open it up for the Q&A. Um, I think one of these th themes was that Israeli academia is a deeply militarized set of institutions that are highly complicit in violence practiced against Palestinians. In fact, it systemically emboldens, encourages, and funds it. Israeli academic ties with the army and secret security apparatus in Israel are well known. It includes research collaborations, uh, weapon redevelopment, special education programs for soldiers, and more. Israeli academic institutions also entrench soldier privileges in access to dorms and education protected by a special law and a judicial system that dismisses challenges against it. This was um, several cases by Adala against this law that discriminates based on granting benefits and privileges to soldiers in higher education. Um, the logic of Palestinians as enemies extends from the soldiers to the academic inst institutions themselves. And this is exactly what we've been hearing today from all these accounts. Recently, we have seen academic institutions honoring soldiers for practice, participating in the recent war on Gaza. But this is not a new practice. Following the 2014 war on Gaza, Tel Aviv University announced that it would grant scholarships for student soldiers who participated in the war. More recently, Haifa University announced it will waive registration fees for soldiers. The Hebrew University went further and advocated for the so-called right of soldiers to attend campus in uniform. And of course, this also extends to collaborations, activity, and legitimation of Israeli universities operating in the West Bank and settlements there. It is in these militarized spaces and hostile spaces that we often find ourselves seeking education as Palestinian citizens of Israel. We are often unable to address all this militarization around us simply because it is so deeply entrenched, taken for granted, and silenced. When it comes to core questions pertaining to Palestinians, Israeli universities function more as a regime of ignorance rather than one of education. These institutions are built and maintained on top of Palestinian dispossession, quite literally, as we heard from Aris. Uh, a prominent example, as we have heard, is Tel Aviv uh, University built on top of Palestinian village of Sheikh Mwannes. The dorms of the university built in the past decade, by the way, by a private company, rose on top of the cemetery of Sheikh Mwannes. The Israeli Supreme Court rejected the petition against the building of the dorms in this location. And this shows us to how entrenched this system of oppression is, how complicit institutions are in um, providing these uh, circumstances. This is all the underpinning infrastructure of institutionalized violence that by the end of the day enabled and emboldened the recent attacks on Palestinian students in campuses over the past month. There is a distinctive pain, anger, alienation, frustration, and burden 
um, that Palestinian students carry when they attend Israeli academic institutions. It is a feeling that takes place on spatial, social, political, and academic levels. Options of Palestinian students to really prosper within these institutions and under these uh, conditions without compromising their identity is almost non-existent. Palestinians are often policed, penalized, and gaslighted if they speak up. The violence practiced against Palestinians is also epistemic violence. It is the constant denial of Palestinians from framing their own reality and claiming it as knowledge. It is the denial of what Edward Said called the permission to narrate their own oppression and experiences. It is the ongoing mystification and reproduction of hierarchy and power under the pretext of knowledge and meritocracy. And let us be clear, it is a power that maintains the status quo of Jewish supremacy and settler colonialism in Palestine. Now, in this context, it's important to remember, as I mentioned also before, that this order extends far beyond academic institutions. We have all seen the recent attacks on Palestinians in Israel by both Israeli police and Jewish vigilante groups. In fact, the police was often protecting the mosque. In Nazareth, the police station has become a torture room. As two of my colleagues, Nariman and Wissam from Adala, have revealed in a recent report issued by Adala. The persecution of Palestinians through waging a lawfare against them is ongoing. And we see it also, obviously, in Sheikh Jarrah and, uh, and the ongoing violence in Beta um, in the West. What these events revealed and surfaced is the militaristic apparatus that governs, persecutes, tortures, and oppresses Palestinian citizens of Israel both from inside and outside academic institutions. It is the logic of oppression that extends in different forms in between the river and the sea. The oppression of Palestinian students in Israeli institutions is important to visibilize, but this oppression of students, of course, extends and is even more violent with regards to Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, Palestinian students. We need to think of them as inherently linked. Um, the Israeli crackdown on academic institutions is well known in, in, in Palestine, particularly um, using visa um, um, obstacles to prevent researchers from entering these institutions. Um, it's a, it's a pheno phenomenon well written about and well documented by many outlets, uh, as well as the sentencing of uh, many students from Bir Zayt, from other universities in the West Bank in military courts. I please urge you to read more about it. And there is something to do with all of this. And by this, I want to conclude and open it up for questions. There is something to do uh, by the end of the day. We need you to speak up against the complicity of many European, American, and other academic institutions in this scheme. We need you to help us amplify Palestinian voices. We need you to keep talking and educating about Palestine. And we need you to, keep, to help us keep pushing. Thank you. I. Uh, We'll ask Nadja to take it on from here, and uh, perhaps we'll open up, up for, for um, questions. Um, thank you all for your presentations, and of course, Nadja, for um, your closing remarks, which I think are really important. So I'm going to start with some questions from the audience and then maybe put in some more. Um, so let me start with one that relates very directly to the where uh, you ended your comments, which is asking for support. Um, uh, so you were focusing on Palestinian voices, but since we're at Columbia, I'll start with a question that uh, comes from a recent graduate. So I'm a recent graduate of Columbia working with current students on a campaign to end Columbia's new dual degree program at Tel Aviv University. For anybody at Columbia who wouldn't not at Columbia who wouldn't know this. Um, there, there were a few dual degree programs at Columbia, one including, including the Sciences Po in Paris, but they're newly launched a dual degree program with Tel Aviv, which means you spend two years at Columbia and two years at Tel Aviv. And students apply in both through the US, I mean, through Columbia and through Tel Aviv. Okay, so I'm wondering if any of the panelists can speak to TAU's violence against Palestinians. I mean, we have talked about that, but and its relationship to the military and how universities like Columbia whitewash Israel's violence by collaborating with such institutions. Um, so I think the question really, since we have certainly heard about Tel Aviv University's complicity is to think about what the stakes are from your perspective or perspectives on, on 
Columbia initiating such a program and in particular at this moment in time. And I actually wanna put one more thing on the table as um, we discuss that because I think one of the fantasies of Columbia was, I think there's a sense of, and, and certainly in the US in general, but you know, once Netanyahu is out of office, then it's a different problem. And I think it's really important to speak to that as well um, because there's been so much coverage of the shift in government um, ignoring who Naftali Bennett is, let alone other people, but we'll let that go. Um, so I don't know who wants to sort of begin by responding to that. Um, and really for students here who are trying to organize against that program. Maybe I can talk a bit about the, the whole idea of international uh, programs with the Israeli Academy, uh, and then a bit about the new uh, government, the new Israeli government. So but I think, and I can put it in a few lines that uh, yeah, I mean, the, the Israeli Academy, as Rabir so much talked about it, and he explained it very good that we, uh, it, it's systematically racist and it's not a normal case academy when you compare it to any other uh, country today and any other modern country in the case. Uh, we as the Arab students that uh, take part in Israeli Academy, my own experience with Israeli Academies like made me consider, made me decide that I'm never going back to the Israeli Academy again. So <clears throat> we're talking about uh, a system that uh, does not really uh, read any other stories than the Zionist Israeli uh, story and doesn't uh, converse to uh, do conversation except with uh, with desires that in this uh, way of conversation, even if you have left-wing uh, professors and left-wing uh, advocates and left-wing, and that's also for a Palestinian, right-wing and left-wing are very close because they all come from inside Zionism and, uh, and try, even the left-wing try to make a better case of Zionism. It's not, we are not fighting to end occupation and we are not, uh, that's a very far case to do that. I think one of the worst things that can happen, happen to the Palestinian case is normalizing with, with the Israeli uh, with with any Israeli way of uh, of proposing to the world, and and of course the Israeli Academy the same. Uh, I remember one day, in one of the years, the British uh, Student Union took a very great decision of boycotting the uh, Israeli uh, exchange pro programs at the, at the time by by pressure from the BDS movement, and that was a very heavy heavy decision. Uh, on the Israeli Academy board and on, on the, the Israeli, let's say, outside propaganda uh, ministries and uh, effort. So one of the ways that students can affect and re really people abroad, uh, I believe myself that the fact that comes from abroad is much stronger than the fact that happens here, also by by Israeli left or by Israeli uh, Jewish freedom fighters who, who would fight against the Israeli politics and uh, and advocate against them. So outside is very, very important, and uh, in the world, it's very important to the Israelis and the academies. One major way to try to to propose themselves and to lobby and to to make dealing with the, with Israel a normal stage and to pe make people forget about Palestine and the the Palestinian case at the time. We believe that everything is political in here, and of course, the academy will never be unpolitical. And one of the major ways that students abroad and people in Colombia and in the states can do. Can effect is by cutting and uh, and making an effort to change the way their their institutions look and uh, react with with Israeli programs and the way the Israelis are trying to enforce them, themselves on every uh, world world uh, facility. Uh, okay, so yeah, that's a bit for for the Israeli academic system. Uh, and when it comes to the, the Israeli new government, yeah, Netanyahu, uh, with the, the Israeli people changed Netanyahu with the help of the Islamic Arab movement and all of these different parties. We, what we know as Arabs is that it's going to be a worse scenario than what happened before because for the first time you have a religious Israeli prime minister who is a settler and the leader of settler groups before. And he's not any less bad than Netanyahu, but he's much worse than these, as at least the Netanyahu. And it's not a person, it's a system after all. And it's the whole Zionist uh, mentality that keeps working and pushing toward uh, the haters toward Arabs and uh, the ending of the Palestinian cause and, uh, and more discrimination and more occupation and more stealing Arab lands. 
with all means necessary. So uh, yeah, Bennett is much more racist and he said it a lot of times and he has all of these quotes that he says about Palestinians and that killing Palestinians is okay and much more uh, for it. And uh, even if he says stuff, he does much more stuff and his history is well known to Palestinians. After all, uh, the liberation of people and the, the achieving of human rights does not come with, with waiting for a change of one racist to another. It comes from by cutting the whole system and act, being active against it in, in real means and every every means necessary in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Well, so I have, can I add a two point? I always say that who ruled the Jewish people is the government and who ruled the Palestinian people is Shin Bet. So it doesn't matter who really <laughs> is the prime minister, Bibi or <laughs> I don't know who we call it, Bibi, Fifi, Sisi, the same for us. So it doesn't matter to us. And also when you talk about a uh, collaboration between institutions, the question is who benefits from occupation? And maybe the University of Columbia benefits from the occupation. So while doing uh, this collaboration with, uh, with a, a, a public and private uh, higher education institutions. Sorry, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, that is the question, uh, Columbia, among other things. I wanna ask one question before, um, I wanna ask for a bit of elaboration from, um, I don't know who feels best positioned to do this, but obviously a few of you can, and then I'm gonna go back to questions. I think, you know, US universities have military presence. There is this thing called ROTC, which is the, Oh my God, I can't think what that actually stands for, but it's an officer training corps that you get applied to, you get when you're in high school, you get that funding from the federal government and you can um, attend college on that as a scholarship. And there was, you know, ROTC had been thrown off Columbia's campus in the sixties in the middle of the height of the Vietnam War and was there, in a very controversial vote um, was reinstated maybe a little over a decade ago, maybe a little longer. So that was, um, Controversial, and of course, given that the U.S. has been at war for 20 years, there's also a big veteran presence on Columbia's campus, largely through um, the School of General Education. And again, people on the equivalent of what's called GI bills, where the federal government grants you a certain amount of, you know, funds for education following. So, you know, it's not. Although I would say the presence of the mili of military or ex-military personnel at Columbia is much smaller than certain other probably state schools, particularly in the South, there certainly is a presence here. So I think it's important to all, which doesn't mean it's uncontroversial, but just to say, I think it's important to lay out so that it doesn't just seem like the same thing, which doesn't mean I'm wholly comfortable <laughs> with what goes on here. But um, I would, you know, Rabbi, you in particular mentioned that soldiers get certain privileges. And I think it would really be helpful for people to understand both within the universities, but also not in the society at large, what it means to not have been, to not have served in the Israeli military, keeping in mind, of course, that with the exception of the Jewish Palestinian citizens and some whatever who can volunteer are not entitled to serve. It's not just that they refuse to serve, right? And if someone, if you could give some context for that, I think that would be really important to understanding what is very specific here in the context of this Jewish state that has 20% of its citizens who are not in fact Jewish, um, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, that's, that is an important question. I think uh, when you were describing the, the US campus and its relation to military, it reminded me from my move from the Israeli campus to the US campus and the differences I saw, which was interesting. It's, it's definitely true that, um, you know, U.S. campuses, especially elite universities in the U.S., are deeply enmeshed and, and complicit in many, many terrible stuff. Uh, they profit, they invest in uh, mass incarceration and fossil fuels, etc. And this is all campaigned about. But uh, uh, when it comes to the military, I think there's it's really incomparable uh, because I remember, you know, I didn't know that when I arrived at Harvard, I didn't know actually there was a military presence. Uh, I only saw one email sent by the administration saying sorry that they have by law to uh, welcome the, the recruitment from the army to some fair they were hosting. But uh, because the army is discriminating back at the time, at least in during Trump, we're discriminating against um, transgender people and the, the university was um, supposed to be uh, 
you know, uh, um, supporting of trans rights. And so it sent this email and it really was a big debate about the presence of the army and et cetera. And that was, that was so refreshing, you know, to see that even when um, uh, military is, is, is present, it is at least contested, you know, and at least there is a reservation or maybe it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a lip service, I don't know, by the, by the administration, but it's still the, the, the idea to think that you have to justify the presence is, is there. You know of the, of the military in Israel, it's it's nothing compared. I mean, it's a revolving door between the academy and or the academia, the Israeli academia, and between power positions in this uh, regime and between in the including the army. The presence of a uniformed army person in the university in the classroom um, is is very much normalized. As I said, uh, it is uh, it's taken for granted uh, that you have soldier uh, uh, classroom. Uh, students sitting in soldier. When I went to Tel Aviv University Law School in 2012, a month later, uh, I remember very vividly, a month later, my class was half empty because uh, the war in Gaza was, was then started and, um, and half of my classmates simply went as reserve soldiers, you know, and it, and it is this context that really puts you in, in existential contradiction in the sense of you're studying with people that this distinction between civilian and soldier is really collapsing uh, and on an everyday basis. Um, and and it, is, it is really this sometimes subtle, sometimes explicit, very blunt references to the military. And it's, it's um, not only in recruitment and not only in its presence in the, in the, um, in the general, you know, like uh, university, um, but also in conversations you hear, as Yara was talking about, uh, in, in the coffee, you know, you, you go to back, it's, in a, it's a daily practice. Its presence is daily, its presence is intense, and its presence uh, should not be normalized. You know, many, many students, Israeli students, think it is normal to start a sentence with when I was in the army, or Israeli professors think it is absolutely normal to explain a point uh, by ref do, making a reference to the army. Um, and I think this is part of the ban banality of the uh, yeah, evil that, yeah. So, this is yeah. the problem. And sorry to jump here because uh, we, we talk about the arrests and the this violation to the campus. Campus in Arabic, I know Nadia, you know it means haram. Haram, it's a holy ground that shouldn't be violated. And by the invasion of the military occupation forces into the academy, and th that's really a, a threatened us. All the time, and not only in the green line, but also it's it's actually it's very it's something common in Birzeit, for example, to take someone and just and start to interrogate him as as a student and put him in jail like forever and no and no, without any trial too. So this invasion and and and, and, I, and I'm also answering the question about a a, univer a Palestinian university in the green line. Uh, there's a that uh, I have to answer it uh, if may I. Uh, you should uh, you should take into consideration that the Israeli government knows well that the Palestinian students are the most are the most active and dynamic group in the uh, in the Palestinian society, especially in time when the political parties are, are less permanent. So they are afraid of us. So the acquirement of an academic education in the Israeli academia itself became an act of resistance and resilience. So we aspire to get our education in meritocratic place. But it's not. So it doesn't matter if we are studying the actual Palestinian university in the Green Line or Israeli University in the Green Line. We are the target because we are very active uh, figures in the Israeli uh, uh, society right now as Palestinian students. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, just to cl clarify, I just was answering a question in the Q and A about whether um, it would be worth opening a Palestinian university inside the Green Line and whether that would be possible. Um, just to say two quick things before I go to the next question. Um, yes, the one thing I have to say that's always surprised, well, not surprised, I'm not surprised by many things, but noticeable is in the opposition to US military or ROTC recruiting on campuses, the issue, the, the, the issue of fighting it was initially that gays weren't allowed to serve in the military and then later with the trans thing you're mentioning, now, I've never been able to decide whether that was simply strategic, but I mean, the US has been at war for over 20 years continuously. 
and no opposition to military presence on U.S. campuses has talked about the war. So, I mean, the sort of imperial blind spots of the U.S. are certainly worth noting here. Um, and to also say what you're talking about, campus is a haven. And it is true. I mean, there are certainly things that happen on U.S. campuses, but when soldiers opened, the National Guard opened fire at, on students at Kent State, I think it was 71, maybe a little earlier, that was like this shocking event in the U.S. That's not supposed to happen on college campuses. And I think that that complicates the discussion in the U.S. around the complicity of Israeli universities and the question of boycott, because there's a sort of fantasy that many academics ourselves have of universities somehow these spaces that are above politics and beyond politics, right? Um, that we're not in any way complicit. And I think that's a lot of the pushback that we get. So um, I want to pose another question, which I think is a really important and interesting one. And obviously um, anyone can start jumping in and then we can move around. How do you understand the kind of education you were receiving at Israeli universities? And what does it mean for you to be drawn into the project of Israeli education in this terrible dilemma? Anybody want to jump in to start? I think it's a really important question. Can I answer that? Because my bachelor, uh, I made in the University of Haifa in political science and Middle East history, but uh, I want to mention something here. Like in the in the high school um, studies in Israel, every uh, every kind of population has their own. Uh, Tuchnit has their own program. So like the Druze, which are Palestinian Arabs, learn some kind of history. The Jews learn some kind of history, another, another section. The other Arabs, which are Muslims and uh, Christians learn something else. So every kind of population, they have their own history, but what, which is interesting that that a uh, um, uh, student in the high, a Jew student in the high school, he learns about the the Holocaust. He learns about the ancient Jews since David and Solomon, and he learns about the a postmodern uh, Jew. But the Muslim or or the standard Arab student in the high school, he just learn about the very ancient time uh, about the Islam, the first years of, of the Islam and the uh, empires, and that's it. That's his history. So when I when I studied uh, Middle East history in the University of Haifa, it was the same thing. I didn't study something which is more interesting or uh, enlightened me more than that. Like uh, in the Columbia University, you have I think he's still Wa'il Halaq. Uh, if I, Wa'il Halaq, like when I read his books, I it's something different to, about what I learned here in the university. And it's the same thing in the learning programs in the high school. But, and I am as a citizenship teacher for high school students, the citizenship is the same program for all the students in Israel. And it is very paradoxically thing, the program, like if you teach it in for Jews, it's very easy. If you teach it for Arabs, it's very hard, very difficult. You have questions that you don't have the answers for them because of this missing ring, the, the historical point of view for, for, for the whole issue, which is the, the Jew student take it from high school, but the standard Arab student don't take it in the high school. He has to study it by himself. Even if he goes to, le to study that in the university, it won't be very helpful for him and to answer his questions. Heidi, before you go out all the way, you can answer, can you explain for people who have not been through the Israeli educational system what the citizenship uh, curriculum is? This, I, I don't know what, what they call it in, in other countries. Yeah, like, I, yeah. yeah. But what does it like, teach you? 
<laughs> it, it, like, let's say something like that. The title of the book that you learn in this program, the title is How to Be a Citizen in Israel. Mm. Oh, it's like a civics class. Yeah, yeah. It's like the right. So it's about the yeah, okay. civics okay, class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think that. about it's, part. Think about think about like part of the Israelization and the uh, uh, steering the consciousness in order to rebuild the nation and ethos mm -hmm. and Zionist wherever you uh, narratives and to inherit it into the uh, in, in 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 the schools and also uh, in in universities. Aris, did you want to jump in on the question about what it, what is it like I to? I, I, I really uh, want to tell, say something that uh, Palestinian students who came to the Israeli university they barely speak Hebrew. We are we came from segregated towns. Mainly, fifty percent of the Palestinian population in historic Palestine lives in in the north. So they came to Tel Aviv University, for example, in the center. They barely speak Hebrew because we live. And we also we we start we we study in our private or public school under privileged public school in Arabic, and we have to move to switch this language. And this, this struggle of the language it's part of uh, the elimination of our own identity because we can't speak Arabic and we can't. We, we speak Arabic, but we can't te uh, study in Arabic in our own, uh, uh, in, in, in when we choose any field to go and uh, to study in university. And of course, it's not only about the language. I was, I remember a discussion related to the Israeli academic narratives and how sad it was for me and many Palestinians to hear terms like Israeli Arabs or Arab sector. We are not sector. It's like undermine our existence as Palestinians and history. It's like erase. They erase all uh, our history by uh, disconnecting uh, uh, us from our re our origins as Palestinians uh, uh, who was here before forty eight, and we are still here in uh, uh, after forty eight. So it's really it's really uh, something that keep uh, keep the struggle on all the time. This is the liminal state we are living in the academia as as, as the Palestinians, and we are struggling with identity and a, a language in the higher education institutions in uh, the Israeli high, uh, high uh, higher education institutions. Did you want to say something? Anybody else want to jump in, or I will? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. I, I'm just adding two sentences about it. Is that the, the Israeli Academy with the with the Palestinian students works as a political system for re, recreating uh, identity for them. So the the peer pressure that it's working on that is is put on Palestinian students, Arab students from from the, the 48 areas and everybody who joins the uh, the Israeli ac academia is not just and it's not truthful it's it's uh, a, a process to re uh, to rebuild the identity and to to create a new a new Arab for them you're not accepted to be Palestinian when you are Palestinian as much as you try for example one of the examples is in the Beersheba University when I was a student before uh, you could never as an Arab you will never get a uh, permission to do your protest on a, on a Palestinian matter or on a political matter inside the campus when all the Israeli movements would, would get uh, the permissions for any matter that there, that there is, but then if it's, it's not political. It's very hard to take, to get a room. It was very hard at the time to get a room for, for political uh, activity when you can see the Israeli party and the, may, the, the, the most extreme the most ex extreme movements, uh, Israeli movements, would take get all the, the permissions and the rooms to to do their activity. It changed with time, but still, you can see it on all the platforms you make and all the reports you have to do. Sometimes, a lot of times, you needed to change the whole subject that you're talking about in order just to get the permission to do an activity in the time. So it's uh, it works both ways, also outside as a pink wash and the wash for for the Israeli uh, uh, image, and it works inside as a wash for the Palestinian identity for students so much. Thank you. Thank you. Before I um, read the next question, I just also want to comment, just to emphasize what so many of you said, and Khalid, you talked about the different, uh, the different programs, right? Like, just to emphasize, this is, right, in American legal, whatever, this is sep quote unquote separate but equal. The logic is that there are separate but equal school systems all the way up. We, we of course know that the separate but equal was 
overturned in the U.S. because there's no such thing. There was no such thing as separate but equal. And in Israel, clearly there isn't either. And in fact, it's, it's a state that defines itself explicitly as Jewish. But that's important to know or to focus on because also then at a higher educational level, there's no, there isn't even a pretense to separate but equal, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so I have another sort of long question that I will throw out to you all. Would anyone be able to comment on the main and emerging academic disciplinary discourses that advance settler colonial ideas? For example, archeological studies that invite Zionists, advance Zionist desires to present historical connection to the land, Middle East and Islamic studies that advances dehumanizing caricatures and racist views of Palestinians, et cetera. Beyond these examples, how else do you see the substance of the textbooks, the lectures, the classroom teacher teaching being part of the struggle for Palestinian identity and freedom. So the question is both, where do you see, it strikes me that where do you think today the strongholds of a kind of settler colonial teaching are? In which disciplines? Are they still primarily in archeology span and Middle East and Islamic studies? Do you see it in other fields? Um, and you know, substantively, I guess that might be the best Part of the question to answer. Are there certain fields that are more profoundly committed to this project than others? Has that changed over time, et cetera? Um, <clears throat> I can jump in on that actually. Um, Nadia, you know that your book on archaeology is not taught in Tel Aviv University. And I have heard that many times from, and that's what I mean when, when I say that when it comes to core questions of Palestinian uh, experiences or framings or points, the, the Israeli university many times functions as a regime of ignorance, really, and not as a, a regime of education. You don't hear the word settler colonialism on Israeli campuses. It's a disciplinary that is deemed a voluntary effort for many Palestinians if they get to, to speak that language and have access to uh, studying it. Um, I think it, that, that settler colonialism studies is really expanding and becoming more popular. Um, it is still far from being taught in Israel curriculums. Uh, I can talk about law schools in particular and uh, how demystified all the legal curriculum is. I am aware that it is also to some extent true in uh, many legal institutions, you know, uh, also in law schools in the US, but there is really something very striking in the experience of, I mean, think about it this way. Israeli law schools don't really teach the military system in place in the West Bank. And this, I think, should tell you the whole story. Um, we, are, we are many times taught on the books uh, stuff that are, we, we, in our day existence, we experience their violation. Um, and and I think despite the fact that settler colonial studies is giving a voice and framing that is crucial for many Palestinians, um, I wonder as Palestinian students, because this, is, this panel is centered around Palestinian students in Israeli institutions, I sometimes wonder about two things, and this relates a little bit about the, the questions we had. First is, what is success uh, in this context? What is success under colonial conditions? You know, if I am and I struggled through this in law school, if you go to law school, what options really as a Palestinian you have? Do you really want to be part of the prosecution, Israeli prosecution? Do you want to become a judge in the state of Israel? Obviously, for me, this was cl clear cut that it's, it's, it's a no, but for maybe other people, um, for material reasons, perhaps, or for other reasons, this question is not thought about or articulated in very practical ways for many other people who don't have alternatives, perhaps. Um, and I, I, I would like to think about it more, about what is success under colonial conditions. And the second is the relation between the Israeli academia and the US. And I think that it's not parallel institutions and these collaborations very much legitimate Israeli academia. I mean, Israeli academia really can't sustain itself without being legitimated and maintained with its prestige in US elite institutions and in these collaborations. So these are not merely a program here or a program there. It's, made, it's even deeper with invisible pipelines and personal relations and, and circulation of uh, professors from elite institutions in the US that come back to, the, to Israeli academia to teach. And uh, I, I, I mean, I see it 
in, in my program as well, in, in, in Harvard Law School, these pipelines exist and they don't exist sufficiently for Palestinians. And this is, I think, where we, as, as, as perhaps you, as people in the US Academy, can push for more representation in programs uh, for Palestinian students that otherwise wouldn't have this mobility. Because by the end of the day, we, the Israeli academia for us is a gateway to the world many times, whether we like it or not. Um, and and that's, that's, that's how I think about them. That's important because of the question also about the previous question about the dilemma that one is caught in, right? I, I think you are. Well, other, I can add something. Other people want to jump in here? Okay. If I can. Uh, uh, once I asked the, one of my lecturers about if there is a free space for studying in Israel in the universities, right? Like any lecturer or doctorate can make any study he, he liked about history or politics. And then the typical uh, answer is yes, it's a democratic space. So I, I told her about a guy that, that I know in, in person that he wanted to make a study like a doctorate about and the massacres that occurred in uh, Al Batuf area, Al Batuf area, which there is some villages in uh, for in uh, the year forty eight, what happened then? But they rejected, and we can add for that that the archive, the the national archive and the national library is not accessible, and there is some material and things that they were stolen in forty eight in the year 48 for lecturers and intellectual people that, that, that are Palestinians. The, their own libraries were stored now in the National Library in Jerusalem, and it's a very hard place to access it. They don't give you permission for that. It, it depends on many parameters, and it's it's not easy. It's, it's not for everyone. So it, Actually, the, the space to make a study is, 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 not, uh, is, is not free. There are some limits. Even if it doesn't appear in the law and, uh, and all the, the, the rules, but in the procedures and the bureaucratic uh, steps that you have to do to access these places, you, you will struggle. It's, it's not easy. And this affects the disciplines and the studies, like not in a direct way, but in the direct way, what they teach and how they study, yes, it affect because some things they take it as like, like as is, like who were here first, who was in this land first, which is right now in studies and disciplines, it doesn't make any sense. There's no importance for this theory. It's just like the minister, uh, which was Arya Dere, <coughs> the minister of, uh, it was a minister in, in the government who, who said that we should make DNA exams for the people who come to Israel just to, to like to see if they are really Jews or not. And, it, and there is no, it's, it's not possible. You can't do that by DNA exams. But until now, yes, these, these theories and this discipline, you can see them in the, in the studies and in the universities. Thanks. So uh, having written the second book, partly on DNA exams, I appreciate that comment. My second book, which deals with the fantasy that you can identify origins, uh, cultural origins through genes. Okay, I'm gonna give you guys a final set, just two questions that are related, and then we'll begin to wind down. So. Um, it's all great. It's, it's great that academia for equality is having an important conversation. The person concurs with much of what's said. However, I think we need to remember the field is not uniform and there is room to move and initiate alternatives. I've taught and written much with Palestinian colleagues presenting a critical perspective on Israel, Palestine and beyond. What do the panelists suggest? How do we crack some of the hegemony on our campuses? Let's think about some initiatives or alternatives. Um, so basically, there, it's the same set of questions on how does one, in the attempt to crack that, so how might we crack them, 
to what extent does cracking the hegemony involve having to engage with Israeli allies and how can Israelis best support Palestinians? And related to this is what are the what are your hopes, if any, for decolonizing higher education, given the existing reality you're situated in in 1948? If people could just think briefly about that. I know there are no easy answers here, but whether you've thought about is there a space? How does one crack it open? What might decolonizing look like? And that might be a good way to um, close the session. Um, can, can I uh, add some? I think that there are no alternatives in the Israeli academia in terms of Palestinians when we are at the same state of master slave situation. We can't crack. Cr cracking this dilemma is by, by admitting a, a, that the universities was built on Palestinian lands officially by the administrative, you know, uh, by the university, presidential universities around the, around the state of Israel. And uh, while the colonization, the syllabuses, the colonization, the departments, we can't, we can't only talk about individuals. We will have to decolonize the system. Otherwise, the alternative is weak. And the alternative is, is exactly like the notion coexistence that uh, the uh, Zionists invented in order to feel safe with themselves while they're living uh, 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 over the Palestinian uh, uh, bodies and also within the Palestinian people on their own homeland. Anybody else want to call in? Any of you want to jump in? Yeah, any, Think of that as your closing remarks. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll add some just, I think, uh, and there was also one of the questions, uh, well, one of the crowd was asking his experience of trying to uh, be involved in uh, in Clubhouse, speed talks about Palestine is Israeli and the whole normalization part. I think that comes close to how people abroad and would be could be active. So a real advice to, to someone who's Israeli or who's, who's uh, Jewish maybe that want to be active to for to to Palestine. I think so, social media is a way for for you to contact your crowd and the people that are uh, close to you, like other Israelis or other people from from your, your area. You you're you're not trying to convince the Palestinian part of anything. Your your activism is is to change uh, ideas and change thoughts and to bring more people to the cause of of Palestine, Palestinian issues, and the, the Palestinian struggle from abroad to to inside it's it's a very complicated case when it comes to social media because people cannot see you really in front of them and then they wouldn't really know because of all of this normalization going on right now and um, all of the uh, all of the characters that are trying to normalize israel and would talk and israelis it's both sided there are uh, that the israeli propaganda machine is going very hard uh, for years now and trying to, to make sure you be scared of contacting uh, someone who's Israeli who's trying also to, to maybe talk about Palestine because sometimes the messages come inside each other and we have seen lots of uh, lots of uh, opposite propaganda also working so I would th I think convincing around you and bringing more people to to the cause in your campuses in your uh, in your activism in your area in your countries uh, trying to change the awareness the awareness is a very big thing and we saw it in the media fight that was going out, uh, going on the past weeks and after the the Gaza war, media was a very important part. It was kind of another country fighting in the war also, and, uh, and struggling with with the people who are being uh, bombed and persecuted again. So I would say never leave uh, never leave activism and know that if you're a student, there are other students who are being persecuted. I've lived it myself that you would be threatened by uh, Shabak and the intelligence agents. Uh, that you would leave your studies and they would stop your studies if you keep act uh, being active and that's how that's something that many Palestinian students and activists have lived it and it happened to a lot also I guess uh, it's it's one cause for everyone it's what's one very human cause that uh, fighting for for this cause is the closest thing to humanity that you can ever get and this is something alhamdulillah we feel also here thank you thank you uh, Khaled, do you want to say anything uh, yes, I, I just want to say that uh, I have been, when we was in the court of uh, one of the students who was arrested, uh, one of the Knesset members has told me a, a story about a foreign student, I don't remember in which university in Europe, maybe in Sweden or Switzerland, who got arrested. A foreign student 
made more than 1,000 students, local students, to go to streets and make protests to, to, to get this student out. But in Israel, it, this doesn't happen. So what I want to say that after all the events that happened in, in the universities here, we have sent the president a, a letter about 10 demands we want for the student. None of them have got response. Uh, the local pressure is not very effective here, but the international pressure, I think it is very effective. Why? Because the universities here take funds for the Arab students specifically. They have programs for them. These programs are not very effective. And the money that the students pay uh, for security and for student councils and associations uh, it's not effective and they don't have any benefit of that. So international pressure may, may have a benefit here, may, may, may get some results more than the local pressure here because the, the environment, the political environment is uh, strengthening these uh, disciplines and these acts from the universities. And I would thank you again for participating. Maybe can I hand it to you and then I will. Oops. Yeah, I will just be very briefly. I just think things we can do in this sense is um, remember also Palestinians students have agency and Palestinian students do organize in independent ways and be sure to reach out and visibilize these efforts as well. To name a few, there is um, the Edward Said Forum of Social Studies uh, Palestinian students in Tel Aviv University. There is the Arab Law Students Forum in uh, the law school um, in Tel Aviv University. There is a similar forum in uh, Jerusalem, etc. And I think we need to also be sure how to make uh, more uh, pipelines here that can, uh, uh, you know, raise um, representation and center these voices that are important and that can lift uh voices that are usually penalized in in israeli academia beyond to transcend these hurdles and i as for the the academic discussion itself i think academia for equality is the only project that is trying to discuss uh these topics and that's that's a crucial point um i i wish that we can emphasize more how much silence is complicity especially among Israeli professors who deem themselves liberals. You know, um, I, I, I think the last month, the events last month unleashed every, and obliter really obliter obliterated any facade of symmetry, of both sightism, of uh, uh, ability to pretend that uh, something normal or something suddenly ruptured happened. This is not, this hasn't suddenly ruptured. This has been maintained and built over years. Uh, and I think it is, we are really uh, pushing in the discourse in ways that we have unprecedented, perhaps. We're uh, reaching um, through social media and, out, and media outlets that are now centering Palestinian voices more than ever, um, reaching wider audiences. And it is time to, to not to go back from here, but really to keep pushing. And, 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 and saying, speaking truth to all these institutions of power, saying that silence is complicity um, and that we, we, we need this uh, uh, representation and this space. So I will end with this. Please do remember that there is a, a link in the chat with um, suggestions uh, compiled and uh, people can just check it out also for more information. And thank you everybody for, uh, for all your efforts. So I want thank to thank you. all of you who joined us in a very late at night, <clears throat> or now it's pretty late at night, at least for me, um, and uh, for starting, hopefully starting what's a really important discussion. I want to apologize to those of you who posted questions that we didn't get to. There are many more than we can get to. We did our best to try to group them and answer them. Um, and uh, hopefully we can somehow continue, we will find ways to continue this conversation and of course to do our part in the uh, helping out from this side of the Atlantic. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, thank you for us. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you to the audience as well. Thanks so much. Awesome. Nice to see you.